welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shell, and I'm joined by Ed Darris and Sam Spieler. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi, Sam and Ed. Today, we are continuing our Postmodern Novels of the South series with Swamplandia by Karen Russell. Our previous book for this series was A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole, which you can find in our archives. Since this is a review, we won't reveal any spoilers. If you haven't read the book yet, keep on listening. If you want to join our discussion, you can find our book club on Reddit by searching for Canonical Pod, one word. And if you would like to support us and also your local bookstore at the same time, you can use our bookshop.org link, which is in our episode description. We are also on social media at CanonicalPod. So Sam, since this was your pick, why don't you start us off? Sure thing. Karen Russell's debut novel, Swamplandia, was published in 2011 to wide acclaim. This is actually her second book. Her first was a collection of short stories. This book earned her a good deal of award nominations, though I'm not sure if it won any. I think it may have won a smaller one. One of those awards was the 2012 Pulitzer, which some people may recall ended up not being awarded to anyone in fiction that year. What does that mean? Like, why would they not give it to anybody? Is that just like dissing the entire publishing industry? Kind of. I remember it being a really big deal that this is not something they typically do. And since the Pulitzer is supposed to be kind of like the Oscars, like this is the best thing happening in fiction this year. We talked about this. Didn't we talk about this? I remember we linked this article before. We'll link it again. That New Yorker article by uh, Michael Cunningham, who was one of the judges. Mm. But yeah, so I mean, I would just say she did win. She's one of the winners, just not the only winner. She's one of three winners. But if the Pulitzer is meant to recognize excellence, that's one thing. But if it's meant to recognize the best books in 2012, that's a different thing. They might say, well, it's an excellent book. Or they might say, it's not an excellent book, but it's the best of a bad crop. Yeah, well, I guess that's a good reason to read that Michael Cunningham article, because I think he's arguing that all three books were deserving, and he was pretty bummed that they didn't pick a winner. Yeah, to pick three as nominees and have them shortlisted and then not pick any of the three that they shortlisted seems like a tease and unfair to the writers. If you were in charge of the world, not saying you're not, but if you were in charge, would you give this novel the Pulitzer Prize, Sam? So I don't know the other two. I know that the other two writers were David Foster Wallace, which we've talked about before, and Dennis Johnson. And I I think, I forget which book of his it was. So having not read those two, I can't compare this to them. But while I really enjoyed this book, and we'll get into all of that soon, I don't know that I would give it the Pulitzer. So it's uh, David Foster Wallace's The Pale King, Dennis Johnson's Train Dreams, and Karen Russell's Swamplandia. Also, the Wallace thing was one of those posthumous considerations, which I'm suspicious of those, just because it's like, yeah, you like him and you want to do something nice for him, but you shouldn't let that cloud your judgment. It's the Oscar Lifetime Achievement Award kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, it's in a way, it's just kind of like, hey, we want to recognize him and we didn't recognize him when he was alive. So let's do something nice for his estate or whatever. Well, we did bash David Foster Wallace in our uh, Philip Roth episode. (laughs) So it makes sense that we'll bash him in this episode too. I believe it was you with the drive-by last time, Sam. So this time he had with the drive-by. I'm not saying he's undeserving. I'm just saying that the idea of giving somebody a award after they're dead is different than the idea of giving somebody who's living an award. Take that, David. Anyways, what is this book about? Let's stop focusing on David Foster Wallace (laughs) and start giving Karen Russell her due. Sorry, Karen. (laughs) Actually, I did note that she is a Portland writer. And yeah. she's about your age, Sam. So, Ooh, you know, uh, but she's married. Just saying. That hasn't stopped That's me before. That's not going to stop Sam. <laughs> yeah. No problems. 
Portland's only got like 100 people, so you should be able to find her pretty easily. Anyway, this book follows the Big Tree family, who is a white family pretending to be Native Americans as part of their alligator wrestling amusement park, Swamplandia, which is located in the Florida Everglades. you got to give an exclamation mark there, Sam. Swamplandia. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Swamplandia. And Swamplandia is failing after its main star, Halola Big Tree, dies a year before the events of this book. Halola Big Tree is the mother of the children in this book. So Swamplandia, as I said, it's a alligator wrestling amusement park. It was started by the children's grandfather, Sawtooth Big Tree, who is now in a retirement community. And it is currently run by Sam, who is also, the, the kids refer to him as the chief. And it used to star Halola Big Tree, who would swim with the gators. And now she has succumbed to cancer. So the kids have taken on. But Kiwi, the eldest of the kids, doesn't have any interest in continuing that and decides to leave, go to the mainland in order to try and dig up some more money to send home. But he ends up doing that by going to the competing uh, amusement park called The World of Darkness, which is based around Jonah and the Whale. Is that right? Yeah. The main attraction is a ride called the Leviathan. That sounded like there were some vague biblical allusions, but that it was mostly just about big, scary monsters, whales of the deep. Yeah. You're supposed to enter like some kind of hell and it's mirrored nicely by Ava who's entering sort of a metaphorical hell over the course of her plot. Right. This book has magical realist, satirical and Southern Gothic elements. And it's about things not being what they seem, the lies we tell ourselves and our families and the bonds holding those things together. It's also about adventure, alligators, ghosts, scams, growing up, and loss at the place where magic grapples with reality. I will issue a content warning here that this book does have a scene containing sexual violence. The biggest reason I think you should read this book is that it takes an already outlandish and fantastical place, the Florida Everglades, and first turns up the magic a few notches with ghosts and big gators, doomed love and cross stars. And then slowly and then suddenly drains that magic from the land and pulls the carpet out from under you in a way that I found tough to wrestle with, so to speak. Ugh, second one. (laughs) You're welcome. But Russell does this admirably, I thought, leaving you wondering at times what is real and what isn't. The descriptions are great and thorough, though occasionally they do get a bit heavy-handed. But it's all in service of a setting with which most of us are unfamiliar. Most of the book is told through the eyes of Ava Bigtree, the youngest of the clan. And so the things we witness and experience through her are at times sparkling with wonder and at others crushing in reality. And that change was done so well for me that it sat in the pit of my stomach and it forced me to think about whether I didn't like what I was reading or whether I was just uncomfortable with where the tale was taking me. One thing I liked is the, what you mentioned there with Ava's narrative. Ava is the narrator for much of the story. And when she's in charge of the story, it does have that childlike enchanted feature that you're talking about. But there is a second plot line of the book with her brother, Kiwi Big Tree, And he is much more of a rationalist, and he is disenchanted, so to speak. And when you read his sections, they are dramatically different from Ava's sections. And I think that contrast is really nice. I felt the same way. I don't know that I liked his plot as much, but I did feel that it was necessary. And I didn't dislike it. Just I don't know that I enjoyed it as much as Ava's. I really enjoyed this novel. It's definitely in the top three of what we've read so far this year for me. 
I really liked what one reviewer said about this book, how it talks about the different liminal states of living in that specific place for that specific character. It's this contrast between living in the Everglades and also living in the city, pre-puberty and post-puberty, life and death. There are a lot of contrasts in the novel, and there are also a lot of changes in the novel as people kind of move from one kind of state of being to another. Yeah, it's all about transitions. Yeah, all of that works really well. Like, for example, this kind of uh, derelict amusement park contrasted with this other more corporate, very successful theme park. So all of that works really well for me, and I very much enjoyed it. What did you guys think about the mixing of genres? Like, for example, it starts more magical realist, but that gets peeled away slowly. I don't want to give any spoilers, but things become more realist as the novel goes on. I liked it, but I think for me, it's a matter of sensibility. I think to continue with my focus on this idea of enchantment, in the beginning of the novel, the entire Big Tree family seems to be very in love with the world that they've created in the Everglades and in the swamp. And as the novel progresses, they start to realize that this enchantment may be hindering their lives more than it's helping them. After the passing of their mother, they kind of have to have a new way to live. And I like that the novel moves in a direction that I think is interesting. I think the idea of enchantment going up against disenchantment and enchantment winning is kind of a trite sentiment, you know, like you just have to believe in magic. You just have to open your heart. Like that kind of story is kind of tired to me. But with this novel, not to give away too much of the ending, but I think that these two worldviews come up against each other. And I think that disenchantment wins. Yeah, this is not Narnia. Yeah, it's not Narnia. And I think that it may just be the novelty of this type of situation that appeals to me more than any particular attachment to one worldview or the other, but I did find that it was refreshing. It really works well with the novel as a Bildungsroman, too. I mean, for me, that's one of the big movements in the novel, is all of the kids are growing up in different ways. Also, their father, the chief, he also seems to change, and his change seems sadder than the rest. I'm not sure if his change is comparable. I think it's kind of tragic in terms of his character. I think he has the most to lose. Right. It's a smaller change in terms of the novel because we don't see a lot of it happening. It's happening behind the scenes. But it's a big change for the kids who are growing up and are forced to see their father in a different light. I think that disenchantment also works really well with the overall theme of America moving toward a more corporate society. In a lot of ways, the before in this novel is kind of like a, almost like a 1950s golden age, small town America feel, even though it's not a small town. It's this family owned business. It's being replaced by a corporate, more homogenous world where everything feels more plasticky, manufactured, uh, less authentic. Which is funny because even Swamplandia... Yes, is inauthentic. Right, is very inauthentic. And everything is manufactured from their own personal histories that they display in the family museum to their names. But you're right, it is a more small town, country folk feeling versus the mainland, which is an interesting difference as well that... They're living on an island compared to mainland Florida. Another thing I like about this novel, and I guess I'll use the word gestalt, is it's kind of like a gestalt of a lot of different literary movements. It reminds me of Angela Carter and Kelly Link, where those writers retell mythology and fairy tales, and they portray it in a more feminist way. They also blend fairy tales with more realist fiction, or at least Kelly Link does. It also reminds me of George Saunders, 
who she, I believe, acknowledged in her book. Mm. And George Saunders writes a lot about the absurdity of work. And Kiwi's storyline really reminds me of a lot of George Saunders, even though it's less absurd than his work. Right. They're definitely not outlandish in the same ways that his writing yes. is. Yeah. So I see a lot of influences from other postmodern writers in this work. And I think that's interesting. She's kind of, she's very much her own writer, but at the same time, she reminds me of so many other writers. I saw a lot of people comparing this to a dark, modern version of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. And also, Joyce Carol Oates's Where Are You Going, Where Have You mm. Been? And Flannery O'Connor's story, where um, the main characters meet the devil. Uh, there's just a lot of moments where you feel that kind of slipping. It's the Southern Gothic slipping of evil encroaching, reality kind of slipping away. It's that kind of effect. It's really interesting. I, I like that, you know, as I'm reading the book, it's very much in the literary tradition of many other very interesting writers, what I also like. One of the, the few weak things for me, and I still enjoyed it, was Kiwi's story. It felt a little like a B-plot to me. Uh, it was important to the story. And like I said, I still enjoyed it just less so than Ava's story. Ava's story seemed like the more important through line. I think it's the contrast between the two that makes it seem less important because Ava's story has a very significant intensity to it that comes from that Southern Gothic aspect that's totally missing with Kiwi's story. It's just that kind of absurdity of work that she lifts from George Saunders. It's the absurdity of working in this amusement park, which is funny and interesting, but it seems light in comparison to Ava's story. Right. It seemed like it was courting a different sort of reader. I didn't have an issue with that as much. I thought it added quite a bit to the novel because it broke up the Ava sections and added a lot of suspense. Though I would say that the time was a bit confusing for me because he ends up being gone for quite a long time. And Ava's storyline seems to be rather short in right. terms of time. But I guess we can talk about that more next week when we can talk about the spoilers. My only real issue with the plot is it's in a lot of ways similar to Station Eleven, which we criticized. It does kind of hinge on a coincidence. And we can talk about that more next episode as well. But I think it would be a little bit unfair to ding Station Eleven and other similar books for having a big plot coincidence and to not ding it here. So I'll note it, even though I thought the plot was fine and really engrossing. I did think about that. I will say that there is an uh, aspect to that coincidence that... Uh, I will talk about next episode because it will be spoilery. But uh, while there is a big coincidence or a couple of big coincidences here, one of those was really great to me that it, it changed how I saw the book. But it is a big coincidence. My biggest issue with the book actually wasn't the plot, but rather the point of view, because I was kind of taken aback when it switched from first person Ava's point of view to a third person. By the end, I appreciated it more, but I'd say that for most of the book, I just really found myself wondering, why didn't she just write it all in the third person? And I think it wasn't until the end when you can kind of reflect on the book as a whole, where maybe you'd say, okay, it's justified. But it just, it, there was a moment when it first switched where it actually pulled me out of the book. And I, I mm. found myself wondering, like, why does she do this? Do you think it has something to do with the immediacy that comes with first person narration? Like everything is happening to Ava and you're seeing through her eyes more closely. Yes, I'm still kind of working my way through this, but... I mean, I'll probably be able to talk about this more next episode, but this is one big reason I think why you feel like Kiwi's plotline is kind of a B-plot. Mm. 
because it does uh, focus on Ava first. For quite a while, too. Yes. I think what kind of makes it work is she ends up leaning more on the retrospective narration. And so because of that third person, you can kind of conceivably understand it as her still telling the story, but from her decades or years later, and she's kind of telling Kiwi's story on his behalf. So I think you can kind of look at it that way. So that's one way of rationalizing it. I think another reason is, yes, it does really make Ava stand out as a character. It kind of focuses in your attention on Ava and how she sees the world. But I struggle with that a little bit because you can do that with third person close. You don't necessarily have to do it in first person. So that's where I really go back and forth on it. I just have to think about it more. Yeah, I I, I really would not agree with you here just because I think that the first person perspective is really important for Ava because it's as much about her psyche as it is about the events that are happening to her. And you need access to her understanding of the world that she's in in order to really appreciate it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's a balancing act you have to do as a writer. You know, you have to balance that with the potential disruption to the uh, fictive dream you're crafting when you suddenly switch point of views. I suppose it's kind of like a cut and paste aesthetic. Like I agree that they do stand in contrast to each other, but I think the contrast was intentional. I think it's meant to be like waking up out of a dream or out of a nightmare. So what about Ava's point of view? Uh, I mean, we, we talked about it being in first person, but she uses a lot of big words and very descriptive sentences to describe her surroundings in ways that sometimes sound like the 13-year-old that she is and sometimes sound like a much more distanced, omniscient narrator. I don't have uh, an example in front of me, but very, very colorful language. And it it was something that I noticed, but it didn't really bother me. But I I did also see that it bothered some reviewers. It doesn't bother me because they're all very precocious people. They're all very unusual people. I think it would be a mistake to look at Ava and expect to find what you'd find from another 13-year-old, given the upbringing that she has and given the lifestyle that she has. Sure. And I think I guess it does go to her characterization some. If you compare her with the chief, she definitely seems like she is more of an adult in some ways than the chief is. The only conspicuous thing that bothered me is when they were talking about the native people who were living in the swamp. And she has some very woke attitudes towards the way that Andrew Jackson treated them. And while I don't disagree with her attitude, it was very clear that this was something that was maybe inserted into the novel to reflect or to signal a certain sort of sensibility on Russell's part. Well, she doesn't present it originally. I think she presents it as something her grandpa Sawtooth taught to her. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not necessarily her own viewpoint, but it's something that she believes. She endorses it. What, what exactly, what do you mean? What things does she endorse? Well, she's talking just about the way that the official history of the native people in southern Florida and the official history of the Army Corps of Engineers dredging the swamp and building canals is very different from the real history. And it's not something I disagree with politically. It's just something that I think is inauthentic. It doesn't jibe with the rest of her character. The rest of her character, it seems to me, is more full of wonder and less full of outrage. And in that sense, it seemed like she was more upset rather than curious. I think it goes to the satirical nature, though, that she and the kids, they all accept and eat up the whole big tree thing, but they all take it with a grain of salt. They know that they aren't 
actual natives. They know that they have not a drop of native blood in them. So they recognize that there is something amiss there, especially Ava. I think she knows that there's something wrong with that and yet still in that childlike way accepts it as part of who she is and you know she would not use a different identity this is she is ava big tree i think one of the themes you mentioned earlier sam and for me this is really important is how history is portrayed and how people are remembered because the story is very much about them trying to hold the memory of their mother yes and the big tree way of life trying to hold on to that so I think it's important to for them, all the characters, I guess, to sort of also tie in the Indian history of that place, because it's also very much a novel about that place specifically. Uh, I didn't really pick up on her being overly woke. I didn't think it was something that stood out to me at all yet. So it didn't affect me. It's a nit here that I'm picking. I agree it's not a substantial thing. It's just that when you have this kind of atypical character, you don't have the external logic of the world to compare her to. You can't say, well, she reads authentic because she's like other 13-year-olds that you know. When you read Ava, you have to say, does her worldview cohere to itself? And most of the time it does, because I imagine where she lives, and I imagine who she lives with, and I say, these things make sense. But when I read that part of her, I didn't think that it made sense. But there's so much else going on in her mind that it's easy to to look past it. It's not a big problem. Okay, let's stop here and take a break. After the break, we'll talk about who we would recommend this novel to. So who would you recommend Swamplandia to? I want to talk about this more next episode, but I think I would recommend this to a lot of young adults, even with the content warning. I think there are a lot of Bildungsroman themes that are really good for a certain age, like older, older teenage. But it's also... I would recommend this to a much larger swath of people. I think this is good for people that are generally into the Southern Gothic or blending of magical and realist elements. I would recommend this to everyone you would not recommend The Human Stain to. (laughs) The two are almost exactly complementary, I think. But I would, I, I mean, it's kind of a joke, but I would recommend this to almost everybody. I wouldn't, I actually don't think this should be pigeonholed as a young adult novel, even though I can see why you would recommend it to young adults. I think that's something that a lot of feminist writers who are trying to take on this retelling of fairy tales are struggling with and against. It's the idea that, you know, a lot of women's writing about adolescence get pigeonholed into young adult fiction. But not only for that reason, that's not the only reason why I wouldn't pigeonhole it in young adult fiction. I also think it offers a lot more to all readers and not just to young adults. It's something where if you read it at age 15, you'll get something. But if you read it again at age 30, when you're working, I think you'll get something different. I'm not pigeonholing it. No, you are. You should feel bad. All the feminists will be out to get you. You're right. Angela Carter, if she's not already dead, will haunt you. (laughs) Well, Angela Carter, because she's now dead, will haunt you. Another writer Karen Russell really reminded me of is Michael Chabon. And this book, like you said, you know, it's kind of young adult. Uh, It's young adult the way that Cavalier and Clay is young adult. I think it's interesting that these two kinds of books came out around the same time, uh, Cavalier and Clay and Swamplandia. 
And I think it's the kind of writing a lot of writers, I would say, of our generation being older millennials and maybe like older millennials plus minus 10 years. I think a lot of writers in that generation are writing this kind of book where they reference back, they cross genres, they have adolescent protagonists. It's kind of dreamy and there's a lot of enchantment and magic. I think it has a broad appeal. It probably has the broadest appeal of anything that we've read so far. I think that it's kind of like the secret history that it's easy to get into, but it does have some meat on its bones, so to speak. It does have something that you can dig into and sink your teeth into. I don't know if it has... Another alligator pun. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. resisting saying anything. <laughs> I don't know if it has a lot to offer the type of person who is a very serious-minded person. You have to be a playful person, I think, to enjoy this novel. You have to have an appreciation for the kind of roadside Americana that Swamplandia represents. You have to see it as somehow redeemed, even in its tacky vulgarity. Like, if you don't have that sensibility... You won't enjoy this novel, but I think that there are a lot of people like that out there. So I think most people would enjoy it. I guess you're right, but I think that is part of the veneer that gets stripped away slowly over time. The tacky Americana thing? The tacky Americana, that it's it's there in both parks throughout, but especially with Ava, and to some degree with Kiwi as well, that gets pulled back more and more as the story progresses. In fact, we don't see Swamplandia much after the beginning. I do think that it's a pervasive kind of tackiness, though. It's it's a different kind of tackiness between the two parks, and it's something that kind of stays with the characters as kind of a, a formative place. All right, let's stop here. It sounds like we have a lot to talk about next episode. Thank you for listening. You can find our reading schedule on Reddit at CanonicalPod, where we also post threads for our book club discussion every Wednesday. You can also find us on social media at CanonicalPod, and if you would like to support us once again and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link in our episode description. We'll be back next week with an in-depth discussion of Swamplandia by Karen Russell. If you're interested in joining that discussion, go ahead and find a copy of this book. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon.